It is a huge pleasure to be here today, and I am in very distinguished company because what today's event is about is this book, which contains the track record, the obstacles they faced, the legal analysis, and I think um, most of all, the frustration that the last three human rights rapporteurs for the occupied Palestinian territory faced during their tenures in that role. We have three immensely distinguished speakers, um, and there is also a forward to it by the current um, special rapporteur, Francesca Albanese. Um, and let me just give you details as to who they are. Uh, I'll, I'll go through them in the chronological order in which they uh, were the special rapporteur. The first was John Dugard, who is a South African professor of international law. His main academic specializations are in Roman Dutch law, public international law, jurisprudence, human rights, criminal procedure, and international criminal law. He has served on the International Law Commission, the primary UN institution for the development of international law, and has been active in reporting on human rights violations by Israel in the Palestinian territories. He is also, it is worth mentioning, the internationally recognized legal scholar on apartheid in international law. He was followed by Richard Falk, who is an American professor emeritus of international law at Princeton University and the Euro-Mediterranean Human Rights Monitor's chairman of the Board of Trustees. He has published extensively with multiple books written about international law and the United Nations. And our third special rapporteur, whose tenure only came to an end last year, is Michael Link. He is the Associate Professor at the Faculty of Law at Western University, London, Ontario, and he was the United Nations Human Rights Council Special Rapporteur for the Human Rights Situation in the Palestinian Territory Occupied since 1967 until last year. The book has been published by Clarity Press, and I do recommend everybody to go out and buy it. I have read it from cover to cover in advance of today. Much of what it contains, as you would expect, is fairly grim reading. But at the same time, it is, it does contain little bits of hope, little green shoots, perhaps, of hope for the future. Now, I'll begin our conversation today by asking Richard Falk. Richard, could you tell us where the idea for this book came from? What is its structure? <clears throat> and what was the reason that it came to be written? Uh, well, thank you very much, John. And th I, I think I speak for the three of us when I say we're very grateful to the Balfour Project for convening this event and happy to have this opportunity uh, to talk a little bit about this book and, as you suggest, how it came about. Uh, basically, it was the idea behind it was that the terms of uh, Human Rights Council special rapporteurs last for six years. And that's a, a meaningful period to uh, engage in that way uh, with the situation on the ground uh, in occupied uh, Palestine. But the uh, advantage of this collaboration between the three of us that roughly covers a 20-year period is that it uh, exposes the continuities and discontinuities that have existed uh, during that period of time. And it was 
an unusual opportunity, I think, uh, to to expose the escalating frustrations that those who try to report on the situation of the Palestinian people seeking the protection of their basic rights uh, endured uh, and endured in an intensifying fashion, which goes on to beyond even Michael's uh, tenure and is uh, has intensified with this new uh, Netanyahu, Netanyahu government. And so we thought we knew each other and we thought that we had enough of the uh, similarity of observation and assessment and sufficient uh, disparities of experience that it would make a, a inter, interesting uh, interaction. And uh, the fact that we knew each other, we were all English speaking uh, as a native language made the uh, collaborative process uh, work more smoothly. It's, it's always a challenge, of course, to bring together uh, separate uh, uh, scholars that don't even live in the same place. But we're pleased with the outcome and think that the structure that we adopted also uh, held up quite well, which involved uh, an opening section of three exploratory essays uh, by each of us in the order in which we serve that describe what it, basically what we encountered. And the most prominent uh, feature, I think, was the increasing effort of Israel to exclude and uh, discredit uh, any kind of objective reporting on the situation that prevailed in occupied Palestine. I mean, that, and, and that has, uh, a, again, uh, intensified in the last few uh, months. The, the middle and most extensive part of the book is devoted to uh, excerpts from our report, which try to give uh, reliable documentation about the nature of Israel's violation and overall paint a picture of an oppressive uh, pattern of administering uh, the occupied territories and have given rise in the last five years to a series of uh, convincing reports about uh, Israel as an apartheid uh, state so far as the administration of the occup of occupied Palestine is concerned. And the final uh, section of the book is to look to the future and to say on the basis of our experience, uh, is this undertaking uh, having a positive effect because the situation on the ground has deteriorated despite our best efforts to call attention to these uh, flagrant violations of international humanitarian law and human rights law. But we feel that particularly for civil, uh, civil society and for the peoples of the world, these kind of reports by unpaid volunteer special rapport rapporteurs provide an objective foundation for understanding the conflict and hopefully serve to mobilize solidarity efforts that will hasten the process by which Palestinians finally 
do attain their basic rights above all the right of self-determination. Uh, let me stop there. And, uh, I hope I covered your uh, question. Uh, you certainly did cover it, Richard, and thank you very much for that. I wondered if I might now go to John. Um, I was thinking maybe we'll look at things in chronological order from your t t your your experiences, the three of you, as special rapporteurs. Uh, John, of course, you were different from the other two because you, of course, were allowed access to the occupied Palestinian territory by the Israel occupying authorities. Is that not so? Could you tell us what were the most memorable or perhaps the key experiences of your time as a special rapporteur there uh, that our audience could take away with them? Yes, John, I had the advantage of being able to visit uh, Palestine and Israel and uh, to travel widely in uh, the West Bank, East Jerusalem and uh, Gaza. And I met with uh, a wide range of people and I came to know uh, President Yasser Arafat uh, fairly well because I was able to meet with him on many occasions. I uh, addressed most human rights issues, but my main uh, areas of interest or focus were first of all, the wall that Israel was building at that time. I was special rapporteur during the second intifada. Uh, I spent a lot of time on visiting the uh, wall and its uh, precincts and speaking to people in the neighborhood and campaigned actively for the uh, request for an advisory opinion on the wall in 2004. Uh, secondly, I uh, focused attention on Gaza. Uh, as special rapporteur, I was able to visit Gaza frequently during that period. And of course, at that time, during my mandate, there were still Israeli settlements in Gaza. It was only at the end of my mandate that uh, settlements were withdrawn. And the third area was uh, not surprisingly uh, that of uh, apartheid. Uh, I've always had a sense of deja vu when I visit uh, occupied Palestine because I've seen it all before. Uh, whether it's worse or not as bad is an open question. Certainly there are some features of the uh, apartheid system in occupied Palestine that are much worse than that uh, of South Africa. I started to be gradually drawing attention to the uh, question of uh, apartheid in the occupied Palestinian territory, because I realized that if I focus too much on this issue, it would affect my credibility. But uh, I drew attention to a number of features of the uh, occupation, which were similar to apartheid South Africa's practices. And then in 2007, towards the end of my uh, period as mandate, I made it clear that in my view, there was really no difference between the, the two systems. So uh, I drew attention to apartheid. And of course, it's uh, important to stress that my two successes, Richard and Michael, uh, have also focused attention on the uh, apartheid nature of the uh, occupation. And uh, I, th I think it's, it's very uh, frustrating to find that uh, our views have fallen on deaf ears. And of course, so have the views of some 10 NGOs that in the last year or so have uh, produced reports drawing attention to the fact that apartheid is practiced in the occupied Palestinian territory. Uh, and in this context, let me just say that I find it very depressing, to put it mildly, that the British government has taken the view in the roadmap that it published last month, roadmap uh, on relations between uh, Israel and the United Kingdom, that uh, the uh, United Kingdom does not take the view that uh, the use of the word apartheid applies to Israel. In effect, it is uh, saying that apartheid never existed in South Africa 
as well, because the two systems are so uh, similar, almost identical, that if you deny the existence of apartheid in uh, Israel, you deny the existence of apartheid in South Africa. And I wonder whether Mr. Sunak re recognizes the irony of this, because in effect, he is uh, ignoring the fact that uh, were he in apartheid South Africa, not only would have not, he not have been able to uh, become prime minister, but he would not have had the vote in South Africa. So uh, I think this is a very unfortunate development that one finds in the United Kingdom, the United States, and many Western European countries that uh, there's a determination not to recognize the existence of apartheid in the occupied Palestinian territory. Thank you very much for that, John. Um, as we're going in chronological order, I'll now go back to Richard. Richard, could you tell us a little bit about your experiences when you were Special Rapporteur? Um, I think I should tell the audience that you, of course, very sadly have to leave early at 6.15. So I want to come on to you now. And could you perhaps also, if I could ask you a second question at the same time, what's your take on what is going on now? Where do you think things are heading? Um, could you could you answer those areas uh, for us? I'll do I'll do my best. They're big questions, big concerns. Uh, I think what John has said uh, speaks very eloquently to what I experienced in terms of trying to analyze uh, the nature of uh, the violations that. Israel persisted in committing and their defiance of relevant international law provisions. As, as he suggested, the uh, most dramatic difference in our situations uh, were, were the fact that I was not only excluded from uh, traveling to the occupied Palestinian territories or Israel, but I was actually detained in a prison when I tried to come and was given the indications that it was possible. We had had our uh, provisional agenda approved by the Israeli ambassador in Geneva. Uh, but this was an effort, I think, by Israel to make a break with the past. Uh, that they had, in their view, attempted to cooperate and the kinds of reports that John delivered convinced them that that was too costly a path for them to pursue. And so they shifted tactics in a rather dramatic way from uh, making a a uh, minimal effort at cooperation with the UN in conducting this these kind of investigations to trying to discredit uh, the reports and the rapporteur and to shift the conversation away from substance. They made no effort to to establish that they were not an apartheid. Uh, uh, regime. They, they, they uh, ignored the substance and concentrated on this use of anti-Semitism as a policy tool to uh, intimidate uh, criticism of Israel. And, and th that characterized uh, the effort. It had some uh, peculiar compensating features, uh, one of which was that because of this uh, major attempt, attempt to discredit me and then later uh, Michael, uh, the media became much more interested in uh, this special rapporteurship and it drew attention uh, perversely to our report. 
and uh, the nature of my report was not as existentially uh, derived from direct contact, but really depended on uh, people coming to the neighboring countries of Egypt and Jordan, Lebanon, and giving a certain kind of testimony. Uh, and the uh, record keeping on the Israeli side provided ample uh, factual foundation for the allegations that were made in our reports. And so uh, we were uh, I felt able to uh, carry out the main purpose of the mandate, which was to call attention and hopefully to uh, rectify the pattern of violations. But as John suggested, we, I wouldn't say deaf ears, but ears that uh, were listening to a different message. And the message was, uh, don't mess with Israel because that means messing with the U.S. at the same time. And I think that had a, a strong effect on the way in which uh, the UN and uh, the international community as a whole has addressed this issue, uh, suggesting the primacy of geopolitics as compared to uh, respect for international law. And I think that's a, a sad but uh, a accurate commentary on the way in which uh, the world is governed such as it is. Uh, the other thing that was comp uh, uh, acted as some compensation uh, for the exclusion uh, was the fact that uh, the Human Rights Council treated uh, my mandate more flexibly than it characteristically did. And I was able to uh, bring into the picture the plight of the uh, Palestinian refugees living in neighboring countries, which were not strictly under the uh, notion of what is what's happening in occupied Palestine, but it's part certainly of the larger Palestinian ordeal, including the violation of uh, Palestinian rights of return to their own homeland and the general uh, displacement of Palestinians in their uh, native country, uh, which was in, in some ways the original sin of Zionism as it applied to uh, Palestine and later uh, emerges Israel. Uh, just as a couple of comments on the existing situation, uh, it, it represents, in my view, an accentuation of the trends that we experience during our time as special rapporteur as reinforced by a kind of explicitness uh, by the presence of these extremists in the governing council of the new Netanyahu government. And given responsibility, which is uh, really the, uh, in a short run at any rate, the most disturbing element, he, uh, responsibility for the administration of, the occup of occupied Palestine is given to the extremist leaders uh, in the so-called religious Zionism uh, political coalition. Uh, and that means an intensification of the apartheid character of the uh, administration, of the, especially the West Bank and East Jerusalem a increased uh, pattern of violence, excess force, which 
was one of the elements I had emphasized uh, during my six years, and a uh, tendency to uh, approach the Palestinian uh, presence as an obstacle to a completion of what I've called the Zionist project. In other words, settler colonialism fails as it did in South Africa unless it effectively displaces, dispossesses, or destroys the native population. And in all the successful uh, settler colonial states, including the ones we, uh, Michael and I, come from, uh, and Australia and New Zealand, all of them succeeded in replacing the native population by the settler population and creating uh, uh, sovereign states that were built on this foundation of what amounts to ethnic cleansing of uh, Aboriginal or native peoples. And I see this uh, I, I see this governing group in Israel as responding to the threat of a South African solution, uh, which uh, arose out of increasing global solidarity resistance and uh, making it uh, more difficult to maintain the white supremacist uh, pattern there than to abandon it. And Israel's taking a very uh, strong, objectionable step to prevent a scenario from unfolding that resembles in any way what happened in South Africa or in a different way in Algeria, because these settler colonial projects fail eventually if they can't handle the native population successfully. And uh, I think that's really the important element of this current situation is an attempt to finish the Zionist project and whether the uh, forces on the other side within uh, Palestine and in the world and in the region, and especially the global south, uh, mount enough solidarity and resistance to prevent this outcome. It's a critical moment, in other words. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, there, was, there was one question I saw in the chat box that I think was um, particularly directed to you. Um, were you given any reasons why you were refused entry to Israel? Yes, I was given dishonest reasons. <laughs> I dishonest was, reasons? Yes, I, it, I, I was told that I was warned not to come when it, the signals were just the reverse. And I was reluctant to come because I had to come from California. I didn't want to make uh, a long, fruitless trip. Uh, and the people in Geneva, which are usually cautious about such logistical matters, encouraged me, they said, you won't have any more difficulty than John had, and uh, they've approved the visas for your uh, a security person and an assistant to go with you. So there was every expectation that I would be admitted. I think Israel wanted this incident to show the UN, basically, that it was no longer uh, cooperating and that it would uh, uh, treat any effort to expose its violations in this harsh manner. Thank you very much. Um, I notice we've got a lot of questions in the chat box about, um, about apartheid. And I suspect much of the discussion is going to um, focus on those later on. But one thing that um, people 
ask is there is a distinction, of course, between the occupied te Palestinian territory and Israel itself. And um, in the occupied Palestinian territory, of course, um, you have a very dif you have a different legal system for the Israeli settlers from that which exists for the uh, indigenous Palestinian population and many other things. But these don't apply in Israel, do they? I mean, in, in Israel, um, non-Jewish citizens of Israel, such as the Israeli Palestinians, do have, um, do have the vote. Richard, in your opinion, would you do you think apartheid also applies in Israel itself? Uh, I, I I do. Uh, I think it's less obvious. You know, it's it's a systematic uh, discrimination in on very fundamental issues, a uh, security system that is prejudiced and use uses excessive force uh, uh, to intimidate and punish uh, Palestinian resistance of a nonviolent sort and is uh, generally uh, uh, connected increasingly uh, to the occupied parts of historic Palestine and uh, the report on apartheid that I participated in, which was issued by the UN in 2017, was not part of my role as special rapporteur, uh, concluded that uh, Israel proper, as well as the occupied Palestinian territories, uh, should be deemed as a single integrated uh, system of apartheid, uh, and uh, the I think the Amnesty International report also uh, reached uh, that conclusion. So it, it it seems to me to be uh, beyond reason. Even Israel's Basic Law of 2018 uh, more or less endorses an apartheid conception of Israel uh, plus the occupied territory by saying only the Jewish people have a right of self-determination uh, within the country of uh, uh, Israel and that Jewish supremacy uh, is the guide to uh, the governing of that territory. So it seems to me at this point uh, rather clear that one should treat uh, Israel and occupied Palestine as a single unit that is that has an apartheid uh, character. But you should get the, the responses of uh, John and Michael because uh, they have some. Uh, I know John has a, a somewhat different view of these issues. Thank you very much for that, Richard. Um, I will stick if I, I, I will come to um, John and Michael on that question. But first of all, I'd like to press on. Um, and because the third of our special reporters, who we are so lucky to have here all in one virtual room today, hasn't yet been able to talk about his experiences. So, Michael, please, could we go to you and could you tell us about your time? as um, Special Rapporteur, and what what did you experience? Sure, thank you very much for this, and thank you for the Belfort, to the Belfort Project for uh, for organizing this. Um, in my, my six years of as Special Rapporteur went from May of 2016 to this time last year, April of 2022. Um, and I, like, uh, like Richard, uh, was not allowed to enter into um, uh, Israel or the occupied territories. Um, whenever I wrote letters to the uh, permanent mission of Israel in Geneva uh, to seek clearance and to let them know I wanted to come, I would be met with crickets, with silence. Um, and so I would carry on my missions to, to Jordan. Um, I've got to say, though, 
you know, one of the observations I, I have of this um, of the situation is that while it, it, this uh, well, Israel and Palestine is far from the best reported um, uh, struggle or uh, occupation or conflict in the modern world. It is, I think, in my view, uh, the best documented um, human rights uh, issue in the modern world. And that's because that there are um, extraordinary uh, reports being issued by international and regional human rights organizations that are full of depth, full of insight, full of analysis, and well anchored in international human rights and humanitarian law. So despite the fact that I was not allowed to get in, despite the fact that I wasn't able to speak to uh, victims of human rights abuses, uh, to see for myself the patterns of, uh, of human rights violations. I, I, but I should say, as an as a asterisk to that, that I had lived in uh, in Jerusalem uh, before. I'd been to the uh, uh, to Israel and Palestine on a number of prior occasions, and I'd worked for the United Nations uh, in the late 1980s during the height of the first Palestinian Intifada. So I had a I had a grasp of the human rights patterns, I, I knew the geography, I knew the people, um, and I knew the history and the uh, and the issues uh, that were there. Um, but uh, the other observation, one of the other, other observations I think I'll, I'll make now in, in these opening remarks is simply to go to the United Nations itself. And, you know, the, the United Nations reflects all of the contradictions, all of the tensions that are present in the world with respect to how uh, Israel and Palestine should be uh, should be approached. On the one hand, you know, at its very best, the United Nations passes um, numerous well-stated resolutions at the General Assembly, uh, at the Human Rights Council, and much more occasionally at the Security Council uh, on affirming Palestinian rights to self-determination, affirming that the Israeli settlements are a flagrant violation under international law, affirming that the uh, annexation of East Jerusalem is uh, is is illegal. Um, there are numerous uh, UN agencies and organizations that are on the ground in uh, in Palestine. I dealt virtually with many of uh, the middle ranking, high ranking and low ranking UN officials in those organizations. And I, I can only speak uh, very highly of, of their efforts uh, and of their impact and of their, I guess their contributions to our understanding through, their, through the many high quality UN reports. The unfortunate thing is that the UN is rarely at its best when it uh, when it winds up coming to, uh, to the issue of, uh, of Israel and Palestine. And I say that because um, the one effective body, the Security Council, uh, which can mobilize, I guess, the resources of the, both not only the UN, but the international community towards a particular crisis, has been hamstrung in its ability to deal with uh, Israel and Palestine. And that is primarily, uh, and here I'm only echoing the words of Kofi Annan in his remarkable memoir from 2012 called Interventions, where he pointed to the United States' role at the Security Council as the primary obstacle for the paralysis of the United Nations and being able to fulfill any of the, uh, of the resolutions that have been adopted by the many decision-making bodies within the uh, within the United Nations. Um, the, the, the United Nations, or the United States has vetoed, I think, 83 resolutions since uh, 1973, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, at the United Nations, 42 of those have to do with Israel. And of those 42, 32 of those have to do with the uh, Israeli occupation of Palestine. The other 10, I believe, have to do with Israel's uh, role in, in the, its occupation of, uh, of Lebanon. So, the, and the United States ensures that the, those resolutions that have passed the Security Council are never put into, into action. So it means that uh, Israel understands that there's going to be, it, it enjoys impunity, there's going to be very little accountability by the international community towards its actions, particularly coming from the global north. So, so if, you know, notwithstanding the fact that Palestine can mobilize a majority of UN members in the General Assembly on, on resolutions, far-reaching resolutions, uh, every December. Uh, it means that um, that doesn't count for as much in international power as, um, uh, as the role of the United States and, and uh, also of Europe, and I will single out the United, United Kingdom, uh, in blocking 
any effective international action towards Israel uh, with respect to as many violations of uh, international law and, uh, and UN resolutions. So let me leave it there, but th that's, that is, a, is, if you like, a quick survey of some of the things that I learned uh, during my six years as Special Rapporteur. Michael, thank you very much for that. Um, Richard, we, Richard, I think the point has come when you have to leave, is that not right? Yes, I'm very sorry to do that, and I'm sure that my colleagues will carry on admirably in my absence. Uh, and thank you once more, and to the Balfour Project for having us. Well, it's been a great pleasure, and thank you so much for your contribution. And thank you also for uh, your role in getting this book um, produced. Uh, there was a question in the chat box about the book that has waved around, which I assume is referring to me, and asking if, it, we, if people can have its name. The name is Protecting Human Rights in Occupied Palestine, Working Through the United Nations, and it's by our three distinguished speakers tonight. But you don't need to scribble all that down because it's on the um, it's on the announcement. It's on the little flyer from the Balfour Project announcing this webinar uh, this evening. So I'll now go back to John and Michael. Um, Michael, one thing I was very interested in your um, in your contribution to the book was you spoke about how you had also um, taken the um, Palestinian Authority and Hamas to task for their violations of human rights law. Um, I think it's important to remember that uh, these violations are happening there as well as, uh, as a result of actions of the Israeli occupation authorities. Um, did you find how did you find your relations with uh, the Palestine Authority and and with Hamas? Because am I right in thinking you managed to get to Gaza? No, unfortunately, I, I, I've been to Gaza, but not while I was Special Rapporteur. So um, the short answer to your question is I had no relationship at all with Hamas. Um, uh, but with the Palestinian Authority, I obviously would meet with its some of its cabinet ministers, some of its senior officials in, uh, in, in Amman, in uh, Geneva and New York. Uh, and elsewhere. So I had a, a good working relationship with them, but it, I also wanted to make sure that I maintained my independence. And where I saw human rights violations being committed by Hamas, primarily its launching of, uh, of rockets uh, uh, that were on, uh, um, on directed and, and uh, could um, fall into uh, Israeli civilian neighborhoods, that is a you know, a um, a presumed war crime uh, by doing that. I was uh, also would criticize when necessary the Palestinian Authority with respect to its um, treatment of its own population, um, most uh, most perhaps acutely in the death of a Palestinian human rights activist uh, by the hands of Israeli security uh, forces. I believe in May of 2021. Um, and as well, you know, so did you say at the hands of Israeli security sorry, forces? I did, I did, and I meant Palestinian security forces. Please uh, accept my thanks for correcting me with respect to that. Um, so, uh, and I was also critical of the um, of the fact that the Palestinian elections that were aimed to be held in the spring of 2021 did not go forward. They were uh, called off by the Palestinian Authority. Um, you know, I understand the reasons why they uh, wanted to be able to have the elections held in all parts of the occupied territory, including East Jerusalem, which has been annexed by Israel. And, and Israel uh, refused to allow uh, the Palestinian elections to occur among the 350,000 pal Palestinians living under Israeli rule in, uh, in East Jerusalem. Um, but you know, there are in, in this modern world, uh, imaginative technologies that could have overcome those kind of barriers for the Palestinian Authority to be able to hold these elections. It, it, there hasn't been uh, Palestinian elections for its legislature, I believe, since uh, 2006 or seven, and there haven't been elections for its uh, for its president uh, for almost as long. 
Um, so for all of those reasons, you know, the, the Palestinians would be, I think, much better served by having a fresh democratic mandate uh, to be able to speak um, to, in, in their voice, both to the international community, to the United Nations and to, uh, to Israel. Um, and the, the longer that mandate goes stale, uh, without elections, without a democratic refreshing, um, I think the, the weaker the Palestinian politic uh, winds up being. No, that's that's very true. Um, John, would you like to tell us a bit about specifically about how you see the situation at the moment and what's where things are heading? It's not a very optimistic situation at the moment, is it? No, certainly not. But before I do that, John, I wish like to uh, mm. return to the questions that you asked Richard about apartheid in Israel proper and in the occupied Palestine. Oh, yes, let's do that now. And Michael, I'll come back to you after John yeah. has answered on that point. Yes, John, please go ahead. I think it's very important to draw a distinction between apartheid as an unlawful system and apartheid as a crime. The International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination categorizes apartheid as an internationally wrongful act. Whereas the Rome Statute and the Apartheid Convention of 1973 uh, categorize apartheid as an international crime. And the, distinct, the distinction really uh, relates to the inhumane acts that are required for the uh, crime of apartheid, which are clearly committed in the occupied Palestinian territory, uh, but are not so clearly committed in uh, Israel itself. For instance, in order to establish the uh, crime of apartheid, one has to look to inhumane acts such as murder, torture, forcible transfer, persecution, and so on, which are very evident in the uh, occupied Palestinian territory, but not so evident uh, in Israel itself. And so I think the better way to look at the matter is to simply say that apartheid exists as an unlawful system in uh, Israel itself because there is a racial discrimination there, but uh, it's not as clear that it is an international crime as it is in the occupied Palestinian uh, territory. And Thank you. Let's for... also bear in mind the fact that uh, the attempt to uh, prosecute uh, Israel before the International Criminal Court at present is only possible because uh, the crime has been committed in the territory of occupied Palestine and the uh, state of Palestine is a member state of the uh, International Criminal Court. So there are distinctions of this kind which uh, should be taken into account in what one's consideration of this issue. Yes, Michael, would you like to add anything to that? If I was to add anything, I, I, I would say this, you know, if, if all we ever looked at was Israel behind its 1967 borders, you know, I, I would think it'd be a very debatable point whether or not uh, apartheid exists. You know, at, at, I think we at least would agree that it is it would be a very illiberal ethnic, uh, ethnically based uh, um, democracy, um, which clearly privileges one national group over another. Um, but when you consider that the entire system from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River is really a one state reality of unequal rights, um, then I think it's easier to be able to make the argument that this consists of, of apartheid throughout. And you can, you can see it as three different classes. Obviously, uh, Israeli Jews enjoy the full privileges and rights uh, of citizens in a, for them, a functioning democracy. Um, Palestinian citizens of Israel have a, a very diminished range of, of rights, but all you have to do is look at the fact that they are allowed to own land and only 3% of, uh, of uh, pre-1967 Israel, um, and that they face enormous social discrimination in the areas of, uh, of education and the economy and the labor force, um, uh, and uh, with access to, to benefits um, that are given only to people who serve in the Israeli uh, military. 
And then obviously the, the third level would be the, uh, the Palestinians uh, living in, um, the, in, in the occupied territory who themselves have, have different uh, category of rights, whether or not they're in living in East Jerusalem, where they are permanent, where they are residents, but without voting rights, or in the, in the West Bank, uh, where they live um, primarily under the rule of the uh, Palestinian Authority, but with uh, overall control by the Israeli occupation forces, um, and, or living in Gaza, or those Palestinians who are exiled um, as uh, as refugees. So this this entire range of tiers of, of rights, I think, taken together, would constitute apartheid from the Mediterranean to the Jordan River. And I'm I'm persuaded by the analysis I've read by Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, by Beth Salem and Yashtin, and by uh, Palestinian organizations such as um, Al Mazan and, uh, and Al Haq. But Michael, may I just ask whether you uh, are arguing that the crime of apartheid is committed in uh, Israel itself, whether it is as clearly committed in Israel as it is in uh, the occupied Palestinian territory? That's the issue. Oh, I, look, I, I agree that we all agree that that it, it is apartheid within the OPT. Um, and if you take uh, only Israel, you know, I'm uh, I, I would think um, there is a good debate. And I, I must say I, I'm I, I haven't I haven't pronounced on whether or not if Israel was taken by itself uh, and in the occupied Palestinian territory were excluded, whether or not that alone would constitute apartheid. Um, as a crime, or whether or not that would be an, uh, a system of intense discrimination, not quite amounting to apartheid. But when you take, when you realize that, that it's one state, effectively between the Mediterranean and the and the Jordan River, um, then I say that it probably is. It's an integral system, uh, and it does amount to apartheid throughout. Of course, that that raises another question, which is, of course, that the whole of the occupied Palestinian territory, despite the existence of the Palestine Authority and the de facto control of Hamas in Gaza, it is all still occupied territory, occupied by Israel for the purposes of international law. And I and am I not right in thinking that the Israeli Supreme Court? Um, basically applies um, Israeli law to Israeli citizens, i.e. the Jewish settlers in that area. And that establishes automatically a very different legal system from that which the Palestinians are subjected to, where they have military courts. And we've, and I'm sure, you know, you have talked enough in your book about uh, some of the egregious breach you know, um, breaches of human rights carried out by those courts. But that is a big difference between the status of the Palestinians wherever they are in the occupied territory and of Israeli citizens who have decided to live there. John, do you want to start with that? Yes, well, I think this is one of the distinctive features of the nature of apartheid in the occupied Palestinian territory that you have uh, two racial groups, two communities, one of which is treated as superior to the other, that the uh, Israeli settlers, uh, together with the uh, Israeli security forces that protect them and are fairly integrated into the settler society, uh, constitute a uh, superior racial group, which uh, is treated very preferentially, as you have mentioned, in respect of military courts, it, it's quite clear that uh, Palestinians are not accorded the rights that Israeli citizens are because Israeli citizens are uh, prosecuted before Israeli courts uh, applying due process of law, whereas Palestinians are prosecuted before Israeli military courts that uh, have little respect for fair trial standards. And if, if I can add to that, you know, the, it, it's, it is the extension uh, every five years by, by an emergency order by the Israeli Knesset that extends all of the rights and benefits of an Israeli citizen uh, to the 730,000 uh, settlers that live in East Jerusalem and the West Bank. They also live in, um, in communities, settlements, 
uh, of which Palestinian Arabs are forbidden to uh, uh, to live in, and in fact forbidden to visit or be on unless they have special permission. And those Palestinians who are in the settlements are generally there to work in in menial jobs, uh, including the construction of more uh, of more housing units uh, in the settlements. So when you have side by side in the same geographic and political unit. Uh, a vastly different range of uh, political, economic, and social rights being given uh, and divided on uh, based on your ethnicity and, uh, and your religion, then that is the classic definition of, uh, of apartheid in, uh, in international law. The, you know, for those, those who might be interested in what the legal definition is, um, it's basically threefold. It's the, it's the fact that one, is there a institutionalized regime of uh, systematic uh, racial oppression and discrimination. I think we can say yes with respect to that and comparing the rights uh, and privileges that uh, Israeli Jewish settlers have versus uh, Palestinian Arabs. Uh, the second issue is, has it been maintained, established and maintained with, uh, to, uh, with an intent to, to have the domination of one racial group over another? And certainly when you read um, the statements of, of Israeli leaders uh, and cabinet ministers with respect to uh, uh, the rights that the, the Jewish settlers are going to have permanently um, in the occupied territories. It's very clear that that part uh, winds up being met. And third, you know, are there inhumane acts that are carried out as part of this regime, which include things like the denial of uh, life and liberty, the denial of full participation in all features of society, the exploitation of labor as a racial group, and and so on. All of those, I think, are amply met uh, in the uh, certainly in the occupied Palestinian territory. And the other thing I'll just mention uh, for, for people's interest is a number of important international, but also Israeli personalities have said this is apartheid. Ban Ki Moon said in a in, in an astonishing. Uh, insightful op-ed uh, in June of 2021 that he says um, that Israel's structural domination and oppression of the Palestinian people through indefinite uh, uh, occupation arguably constitutes apartheid. Uh, Desmond Tutu has agreed with this. Michael Benyar, who was the Israeli Attorney General between 1993 and 1996, said uh, last year that Israel has become, and I'm quoting, an apartheid regime, a one-state reality the two different peoples living with unequal rights. Uh, Ami Alion, who was the former director of, Bin, uh, of the uh, Shin Beit, wrote in his memoir, he says, we've already created an apartheid situation in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, where we control the Palestinians by force, uh, denying them self-determination. And finally, two former Israeli ambassadors to South Africa have written that Israel's systematic uh, discrimination um, on the basis of nationality and ethnicity now constitutes apartheid. And again, I'm quoting them. So I, I think that the, re, the reality before our eyes is becoming evident and is becoming much more mainstream now that the over the last two to three years, uh, the international human rights movement has, uh, has endorsed this. So I, I think we can say with some confidence, giving these Palestinian voices, these Israeli voices, these international voices, all of them credible, have found that this amounts to apartheid in South Africa. And this is something, you know, that I'm blessed to know John Dugard, who's been saying this for well over a decade. And of course, um, uh, we can go back to Jimmy Carter's book, Peace or Apartheid, mm -hmm. which I think was very prescient. I, I think that, that must have come out in the 1990s at some no, point. No, it was about 2010, I believe, roughly. Who oh, was it? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Could I change the subject just very slightly and move on from um, apartheid, um, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and so on, which you have documented so meticulously in your work, which is um, recorded in this book. Uh, but where are, what do you think the chances are for um, some kind of judicial authority um, taking some action on this. Can either of you tell us anything about what the International Court of Justice in The Hague or the International Criminal Court could do? And do you think they will? Which is another question. John, do you want to comment on, on the ICC and I can comment on the ICJ? 
Yes, uh, let me comment on the, the ICC. Um, in 2018, the State of Palestine referred the uh, uh, question of the uh, crime of apartheid and other international crimes uh, to the uh, International Criminal Court. And uh, the uh, International Criminal Court has found that it uh, does have jurisdiction to consider this matter and that the complaint is admissible. But for the last couple of years, the prosecutor, Mr. Karim Khan, who is a British national, uh, has simply refused to take any action. And uh, I think, yeah, it's very interesting to compare the way in which he has responded to the war in Ukraine with the uh, conflict in uh, occupied uh, Palestine. Uh, I applaud the fact that he has decided to institute a prosecution against President Putin, but I must ask the question, why has he not done this in respect of Israel, where the evidence is much clearer and the criminality of the occupation is much clearer. And of course, one also has uh, uh, unlawful occupation as, and unlawful annexation in uh, occupied Palestine. And so the similarities are very great, but the uh, prosecutor has declined. And I'm, I hesitate to say this, but it seems very clear that uh, he has been put under great pressure by the United States and uh, European states. Uh, the United Kingdom has made it very clear that it is opposed to the uh, prosecution of Israel before the ICC. And uh, so have most European uh, governments. So I, I think that the uh, International Criminal Court has really discredited itself by failing to act when the evidence is so clear and the criminality is so clear. Thank you very much for that, John. Um, Michael, could you turn to the um, uh, to the International Court of Justice? Sure. And and to be clear, I mean both courts are in the Hague. The International Criminal Court is responsible for for looking at war crimes, crimes against humanity, uh, and crime of aggression and genocide um, under the Rome Statute of 1998. The International Court of Justice, a, sep a completely separate court, um, is uh, um, has been around for a number of decades and is the highest judicial body in the UN system. And it primarily looks at uh, disputes between states um, but also will accept what are called advisory opinions being requested by the UN uh, General Assembly. This occurred uh, almost 20 years ago when the UN General Assembly asked the, uh, the International Court of Justice for an advisory opinion um, and, and, and large thanks to the work of, uh, of John Dugard when he was Special Rapporteur um, to ask whether or not the, the wall being built at that time on mostly on um, uh, West Bank um, uh, was was legal or not. Um, a number of advisory opinions have been asked of the court over the years, including um, 60 and 50 years ago on Namibia, and uh, more recently, uh, uh, which many many of you in the United Kingdom will will, will remember, with respect to the Chagos Islands, uh, where the United Kingdom uh, lost in front of the ICJ in 2019. Um, in December 30th, 2022, so three and a half months ago, the General Assembly passed a resolution asking for a series of questions to be put as an advisory opinion to the International Court of Justice, including the question of what are the legal consequences of the fact that Israel is denying uh, or thwarting Palestinian self-determination? What are the legal consequences of, of uh, the legal status of the uh, Israeli occupation of Palestine, you know, essentially asking, has the occupation now become illegal? Uh, also asking with respect to what are the legal consequences arising out of the any patterns of discrimination? Uh, while not using the word apartheid, it, seem, it certainly seems to suggest that uh, entrenched discrimination is going to be one of the uh, legal issues in front of the International Court of Justice. Um, the International Court of Justice has set up now a timetable for 
uh, for written submissions to be made. And I would guess that, you know, sometime early next year, February, March, April of 2024 is when this case will be argued in front of the 15 judges of the International Court of Justice. Um, it will deliver an opinion. It's simply an advisory opinion, but there, the uh, International Court of Justice has um, a very high reputation in the international community, and its findings will be closely, uh, I think, looked at by the, uh, by the by the United Nations and the international community, particularly by those in the global south who, who support Palestine. You know, this could be um, a game changer, particularly if it finds that um, the that it is an occupation that is no longer legal and that and then it's going to be answering the question, what, what are the legal consequences, uh, which may mean that the world cannot give, the international community may not uh, should not be giving um, aid or sustenance that will wind up furthering uh, th this uh, this particular occupation. With respect to the questions of discrimination or of self-determination, um, again, you know, the International Court of Justice said in 2004 that, you know, the Palestinians have the right to self-determination. This is a right that's also been uh, repeated, repeatedly stated by the International, by the UN General Assembly and by the UN uh, Security Council. So with all of these in mind, it's obvious, you know, that the court will have to address not do the Palestinians have the right to self-determination, uh, but uh, what, why is it being thwarted, and what are the legal consequences that the world has to uh, has to follow in order to ensure that Israel's thwarting of the of the right of self-determination must be brought to an end. So between, you know, there is very few legal forms in international law, unlike what we all know and enjoy in domestic law. So. You know, the Palestinians are using, I think, you know, their the diplomatic cards that they're able to play to be able to advance these questions, both at the ICC and the ICJ. Uh, but ultimately, it will be political decisions. Um, and it ultimately will be like the work of civil society in various countries across the world who will put these decisions into effect through, the, uh, through uh, I guess, their political work in their own individual countries. Thank you for that. Um, one thing that occurs to me, of course, with regard to the UK, is that um, our government, Rishi Sunak's government, has said that um, it doesn't want to use the word apartheid, because it thinks the word that the, the question of apartheid is one for international tribunals. So maybe an advisory opinion, this advisory opinion, if it comes out next year, may actually help our government to know whether there is actually a state of apartheid in the occupied Palestinian territory or not. We're coming to the end of our time, but we've had some very distinguished people with us today. And I've got a question from Avi Schleim, which I'd like to read to you both. Um, can you say something about the right to resist under international law? including violent resistance, given, given that young people in Palestine are resorting increasingly to armed resistance. Um, I think this is a rather contentious area, isn't it? I'll, I'll start. I'll try to be very, very brief with respect to this. I know John would have uh, um, enlightened comments to make as well. You know, I always, whenever I'm asked this question, I think of the French resistance during the Second World War. Um, uh, people have a right to be able to resist alien rule, including uh, occupation, particularly illegal occupation. Having said that, it doesn't mean that the resistance is without boundaries of its own. Um, so attacks uh, by, uh, in a noble cause uh, that may uh, target um, uh, deliberately or reckless, recklessly, civilians of the occupying forces um, would be illegal and uh, and therefore beyond uh, the right of, of resistance forces to uh, uh, to effect. Um, we've recognized through a series of res important resolutions in the General Assembly over the last 60 years that uh, people living under alien rule do have the right to uh, armed resistance with respect to this. Having said that, uh, and, and I'm and I, I look at this in, in, in Palestinian terms through the eyes, A, of the grossly asymmetrical balance of power, uh, and B, thinking that 
you know, when I lived in Palestine uh, in the late 1980s during the first Palestinian Intifada, that was largely an unarmed uh, resistance. And it was, I think, quite effective to be able to use strikes and boycotts and demonstrations uh, as your form of civil disobedience uh, to an unjust rule. And that in many ways was far more effective. And in many ways, uh, it led to greater international understanding and in, in international sympathy with, uh, with what is going on. So, um, you know, as a, as a lawyer, as a formal sp former special rapporteur, I would say that, and I do know that there's many acts of civil disobedience and non Nonviolent resistance that are that are used by Palestinians even today. Um, I would say if those only could be marshaled and, and applied in uh, in greater force, um, we I think there'd be more success uh, in resisting this occupation uh, than through armed resistance uh, um, um, as it's been currently conducted or recently conducted by Palestinians. The other quick comment I'll say is. We're seeing this armed resistance because Palestinians, particularly young Palestinians, are seeing the Palestinian Authority as ineffective in in uh, in bringing about uh, freedom and uh, and liberation. And as long as the Palestinian Authority is stuck as administrating uh, to the Palestinians um, in the municipalities where where it, it does administer, but unable to, to to move diplomatic leverage to bring a Palestinian state. Uh, within on the horizon, you're going to see uh, uh, resistance um, culminating in armed resistance by these armed groups uh, if they see no political uh, path to a uh, to a, a free future. Thank you very much, um, John. Would you like to add to that? No, I agree with everything that Michael said, and I'm particularly pleased that Michael referred to the experience of the French resistance and to resistance movements in other Western European countries during the uh, Nazi occupation. I think it's very important for people in Western Europe to see the Palestinian situation as very similar to that which prevailed in Western Europe during the Second World War. Uh, Palestine is an occupied territory. It's been occupied for 56 years. And uh, if you are to categorize the Palestinian resistance uh, fighters as terrorists, then you must uh, accept that the resistance movements in Western Europe are also to be classified as terrorist organizations. So I do think it's very important that we should look at occupation in the light of the uh, experience of the Second World War. Thank you very much for that. Um, of course, one other factor, and this has just been drawn to my attention by uh, Sandra Hamruni, one of our trustees. In fact, the Palestinians have less ability to use civil disobedience, etc. And at the same time, the international community is finding its own avenues of protest, such as um, boycott, divestment and sanctions against settlement products. All that is being curtailed to a very considerable extent. And that, I suppose, just makes everything much more explosive. And regrettably, where things become explosive, but you, you are going to have an explosion. It's, it seems very sadly the case that we are destined to have quite a lot more violence. And uh, it's a very sad thing, but it shows why political action by governments, including our government in the United Kingdom, is so important. I, I, will, say this, I will say this, John, that uh, yeah, all we have to do is look at the preamble to the 1948 Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which says that if, if men, you know, in the antique language of the, of the day are not to uh, have to resort to to arms or, or to violence we must uh, we must develop rights we must enforce rights through the rule of law and I can think of no more prime example of that than the uh, um, uh, than what is happening now in uh, uh, in Israel and Palestine and I, I do want to add on to what you said uh, recently about uh, your Prime Minister uh, Sunak uh, who who uh, issued a written agreement when Benjamin Netanyahu uh, visited England last month 
um, where he where he said or they said that it was uh, folly for the Palestinians to seek um, justice at the International Court of Justice through the advisory opinions that I referred to a few minutes ago, saying that they this only drives the parties further apart from being able to engage in a peace process. What peace process? There hasn't been a peace process since um, uh, since 2014 when the Kerry Initiative collapsed. Benjamin Netanyahu and every previous government to him have, have indicated they intend to remain permanently in the occupied territories uh, or to control Gaza. Uh, there's, they, have, they will never issue the magic words of Palestinian state or certainly one that is a genuine Palestinian state with respect to this. So um, uh, if you're going to block um, any meaningful diplomatic process that's built on rights and built on international law, if you're going to deny Palestinians the forums of the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice and the United Nations General Assembly and Security Council, um, uh, that, and you're going to block um, peaceful um, no, uh, no resistance to the um, to the Israeli occupation through banning or forbidding or discouraging uh, BDS uh, activities, um, then then tell me why is it what's the logic you would explain to a young Palestinian why he or she shouldn't take up armed resistance? Um, I've tried all throughout my professional life when I've dealt with Palestine uh, to point the way to the rule of law and in international law and Western countries uh, through their actions and through their statements are discouraging us from using that process from reaching a peaceful uh, resolution. I'd say not just through their actions and their statements, but also through their inactivity. Mm -hmm. if, if John, do you want to make any... I think we've got to wrap it up now, but John, do you want to make some, have something to say on this or make any other uh, final remarks? I'd like to make one brief comment, and that is that you referred to a BDS and to the mobilization of international civil society to oppose the occupation. The main obstacle in the way of the success of this movement is the way in which anti-Semitism has been weaponized by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of uh, anti-Semitism, uh, which uh, really uh, amounts to saying that uh, criticism of the uh, policies and practices of Israel in the occupied territory uh, is anti-Semitism. And I think, again, it's very unfortunate that the roadmap that was published on the occasion of uh, Netanyahu's visit to the United Kingdom also refers to the fact that the British government uh, has committed itself to uh, supporting the uh, definition of uh, anti-Semitism uh, provided by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. And I think this is really, very unfortunate. I think I think you are absolutely right, John. Um, I would actually mention, of course, that there is another definition of anti-Semitism, the J Jerusalem yes, uh, yes. definition. And if people aren't aware of that, please look it up, because it is a, a far superior uh, uh, definition, and it's one that is actually much clearer and therefore more effective at combating anti-Semitism, and it doesn't confuse different issues, which, as all lawyers know, is the road to perdition. John and Michael, thank you both so much. Um, it's been a great session, and I'm now going to hand us back to Dee. Hello. Um, that was fascinating. Thank you so much for that. Um, we've had loads of comments, um, which I will be sharing with the speakers, so they will see all of your kind comments, all the questions we didn't have time for. There were so many. We had lots of attendance, lots of questions, as you can imagine. Um, but now it's the time that I get my cap out. Um, we host these webinars for free because we want to get the word out and we want to be able to um, share information, give people working on the issue, the um, facts and figures and stuff that they need to keep them motivated and to help them continue to raise awareness on these different issues. So, um, but if you can, saying that, if you can help us at all with any kind of donation, then I have popped a link in the, um, in the chat box and you can find it easily on our website. 
Um, but also, if you sign up for any regular donation, any either annual or monthly donation of any amount, then you automatically become a friend of the Balfour Project, which entitles you to free film screenings when we do movie screenings, um, discounted tickets for certain events, such as our upcoming conference, and also some opportunities to have meetings with key um, players in the Balfour Project so that you can get some um, insight into what the charity is up to and we can get feedback from you as well. Um, so links were in the chat box. Uh, have a little look. And um, that's it for me, really. And thank you so much, everyone, for taking part, the Johns and Michael and Richard, who's now gone, but we're still grateful. And um, and we will see you at the next one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night.